Uh, okay, sure, no problem. Hi, everyone. So welcome to this workshop, uh, which we're going to cover prep time efficiency. So prep time is especially difficult to nail. And it's very difficult to also improve because of course, your judges don't see how you prep. And so you almost get virtually zero feedback on the efficiency of how you prep. But note that a lot of debates are lost and won based on what happens in prep time. So we thought it was really important to try to cover how to do prep time efficiently, how to target the clashes and preempt what the debate's going to be about in a really almost like systematic and formulaic way. So no matter what motion they hit you with, you're prepared for any motion and you're basically guaranteed a baseline standard of performance, no matter how uncomfortable a motion makes you. But yeah, next slide. So first, what should you look out for for when you think about prep time. So note that a lot of mistakes that novices or even just like debaters who are reaching like that mid-tier level tend to make is that they just think prep time they go straight into talking about arguments. Um, so if you're in proposition, they go straight into thinking about government arguments that they can make in the debate. Um, and if they're in closing, they just think about even more arguments they can make. They rarely think about whether or not these arguments are strategic to make in the first place or how to make them strategic. So instead of thinking about prep time as just 15 minutes to think and brainstorm as many arguments as you possibly can and choosing the best sounding ones, try to think about it in a more systematic formulaic way. So prep time really about is about making accurate predictions about what this debate is going to look like. Um, and with that in mind, what that what people are going to be saying in this debate, how do you correctly strategically position yourself such that your arguments are the most impactful and the most well weighed or the more, more most robustly analyzed argument in the debate. Um, and by like understanding how a debate is actually going to play out, you can then generate kind of more comprehensive argumentation, more comprehensive weighing, more comprehensive rebuttals, etc. Um, so a debate should never ever just be about prepping one side and one case and arguments that are insulated with what you preempt everyone is going to say. Um, so this becomes slightly more clear later on. So next slide, please. So um, this is what prep time roughly is going to look like. And these are the ways that you can preempt what a debate is going to be about. Uh, first, you have to clarify that you and your partner actually know what the burdens of the debate are. Um, so this is what we call initial clarifications. Um, so this is where you look at things like wordings of the motion. Um, so is it this house regrets motion? Is it this uh, actor motion? Is it this house believes that motion? Um, and is there any kind of specific wording that you need to go through that kind of changes what, what burdens debates debaters need to prove? Then secondly, you can talk about the opposite side's case. Um, so before you even think about um, generating your own arguments, you should roughly think about what the other side is going to say. Does this mean that you spend all the prep time thinking about what the other side is going to say and not building any of your own arguments? Try, no. It's just like try to think about it in a more comprehensive and holistic view. I rarely nowadays go into debates thinking about what arguments I, I'm going to make. Rather, I think about what's broadly going to be said in the debate um, and how, therefore, I can position myself strategically in that debate. Um, thirdly, you can identify contention. So once you kind of know what the other side is going to say, um, then you can say like, okay, so what are the key points that we are actually going to disagree upon? So note that debaters often agree upon a lot of stuff. So for example, they tend to agree on a characterization of a problem. So if it's something like this house believes that you should implement, implement gender quotas um, in STEM subjects in university, both sides would tend to agree that the underrepresentation of women in STEM subjects in, at a higher level tends to be a problem. Um, what they disagree upon, for example, is how you fix that, whether or not a motion makes it better or worse. How, for example, um, men who are doing STEM are likely going to respond to women, that it could be a key contention. How women themselves are likely going to internalize affirmative action and their self-esteem in response to that, that's another contention. Um, so try to really identify what key questions both sides are going to be disagreeing upon and what things they're not going to be disagreeing upon and therefore what time, like what amount of time, where time should be allocated most efficiently. Um, and then the fourth one, finally, it's when you actually generate your argument. So now you know what you need to prove and what you what clashes and contentions you need to win. Then you can start making that really robust analysis that goes into proving those specific questions. So the temptation is always to go talk about like to start start rambling like an answer but note that in order to ramble an answer you need to understand what the question is first so all three 
part, first parts of prep time, it's understanding what the debate is asking of you. And the last, oh, it's only the last part where you start to answer that question. Um, so next slide, please. So initial cl clarifications. So this is where you sort out the initial wording of the motion. So a lot of debates are relatively straightforward in what they ask you to do. So maybe it's like this house believes that blah, blah, blah has done more harm than good. It's pretty clear what the burdens are. You just have to prove that it's more harm than good. Um, but th this doesn't mean that all debates are really straightforward. Lots of debates require very specific burdens that loads of people always fail to understand. So firstly, type of motion. Um, so some motions require very specific considerations. Uh, is the screen meant to be black? No, it's not. Uh, it, I don't see, like the screen is not black for me. Is anyone else having that problem? It's not black for me. Yeah, screen is visible. I think, maybe have, I think it's because Tom's video feed is black and you may have, to, you, may, you may be watching Tom's video feed. <laughs> yeah. Try to try to pin the pin the screen share. Tell us if it keeps going on. But anyway, so yeah, so some motions require really specific considerations. So for example, like uh, if it's a this house regrets debate, you need 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 to introduce a historical counterfactual. It is not a optional thing that you can do. You can't believe how many times we have gone into debates and it's a this house regrets debate and we are the only, we, we are the only team that introduced a counterfactual from closing opposition. Um, and so you need to talk about a historical counterfactual, i.e. what happens if this event never occurred um, from the get-go as OG or as OO. Um, and so because of that, like, please remember the specific burdens that a specific type of motion Im implements on you. So if this, similarly, this house would, that means you have to be quite clear about what this policy is going to look like. So for example, if um, it says like this house, uh, as the feminist movement would adopt the narrative that blah, 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 you need to make sure that you actually tell me what adopting this narrative actually looks like. So if it's something like this house would, as the feminist movement would adopt the narrative that you know, uh, men are equally harmed under patriarchy as women, you need to actually tell me how they actually adopt this narrative. So are they going to start saying this at all their feminist rallies? Are they, is this the main message they're gonna be pushing on social media? Um, you know, like do they get rid of all kind of contesting norms, for example, like getting rid of just like, ah, uh, you know, like, call, like make, making fun of men slightly, you know, for being too sensitive or being snowflakes. So like, talk to me about what this actually looks like on the ground, if it's a this house wood motion. This house as X, um, of course, this is an actor motion. So be really clear about what the actor cares about and what their interests are. Um, and then show about, show how you actually achieve or fulfill those interests. Um, yeah, and if it's a hypothetical movement, assuming the technology exists, or this house prefers a world in which, um, don't waste your time contesting or not whether or not this technology actually works. Um, there have been some debates. I've seen an out round where someone didn't read the motion and just said, ah, this technology would never be able to like, to possibly exist because it violates the laws of physics. Like if the motion says, assuming technology exists, don't waste your time contesting about whether or not the technology can exist. Um, so all types of motions have specific burdens and characterizations they like put onto you. So being very clear about what they are. Secondly, wording of the motion. So pay attention to every word in that motion because it, they make slight changes to what you have to support. So for example, if something says this house would aggressively redistribute or this house would strongly condemn um, and you're in government, you can't just make generic arguments about why it's kind of a good idea to, I don't know, redistribute income or like condemn, uh, condemn certain actions um, because opposition could easily come up and say like, look, we are okay with calling out or condemning a little bit or we are okay with distributing to some extent, but government has failed that burden because they have to show us why they support aggressively redistributing or strongly condemning. So be really clear when there is like an adjective or just like an extra word in the motion that you understand how that affects your team's position and how that affects the burdens you need to prove. The last one, new and weird policies. So like if, if, okay, so the problem with loads of CAs nowadays is that 
they often think they're smarter than actual policymakers and will try to fix a real world's problem with a new interesting policy they thought of in the shower. Um, and so if they come at you with some very strange, weird policy, um, try to make, like, it's sometimes favorable to help you understand that motion and where they're coming from by, like, intuition popping or thinking about, you know, like, an analogous situation when this has happened. Um, so I'm going to use an example that I recently did, which is like, this house believes that, you know, Kazakhstan should hold free and fair local elections. Um, very unclear why Kazakhstan would want to do this, um, especially when, you know, it wants to keep a strong hold um, of control on the ground. Very unclear why you'd want to do this. And of course, we are government, we had to find some reason why they Kazakhstan it was in the Kazakhstani government's interest to actually hold free and fair local elections um and the way we did this was analogized to another country that was kind of in a similar position that was doing the same thing so China was starting to like you know hold free and fair local elections but it roughly had the same incentives as Kazakhstan it's no by like by no means a democracy um, but so why is it holding democratic elections? And we knew from the China example that it was ah, because like local people are demanding more and more democratic free will and rights as their incomes have increased and their material well-being has increased. Um, they're getting increasingly sick of local strongmen being corrupt. Um, uh, and, you know, like all sorts of things. So free and fair elections were a type of tool that the CCP offered to appease those local sentiments. Um, and so by understanding what happened in China, then I can say like, oh, okay, I understand what the CAs are getting at with this Kazakhstan motion now. And a lot of the analysis becomes so much more intuitive. Um, so if you're ever stuck on why you think a like a CA has set a new and weird policy to fix a real world solution, uh, a, new, a, a real world problem, try to think about analogous situations um, and that will really help your prep time process great uh, i think yep next slide yeah and so also try to problematize the motion so if you're ever struggling with a motion or you're just like struggling to think about why this motion is even de being debated you can't really think about arguments for your side um, or the other side try to understand why was this motion said um, so without going into any side's arguments, try to clarify with your partner what the motion is broadly about. So loads and loads of motions will be about a problem that needs to be solved. Um, so maybe it's things like sexism or racism or police brutality, and they all try to seek a problem and try to show how this changes in a bad or better way with the motion. Um, so when you're talking with your partner, try to understand why has been said. So question to ask is like, what problem is the motion addressing? Or if it's an active based motion, what are the broad interests of that actor? So it's something like this house believes that it is in Donald Trump's interest to postpone the US elections. Um, and you have no idea why he would ever want to postpone the US elections. Try to think about what his interests are. Um, so just like, you know, probably he's a business tycoon. So probably once his Trump business dynasty to go well. He probably wants to be reelected as the next US pre president to the extent that he's running. So like by clarifying what the interests are of the actor involved, if it's an actor focused motion, it becomes clear what kind of arguments you're supposed to be getting at. Um, so for example, this has believes that the Mexican government should adopt measures that enable one cartel to monopolize the drug market. You have no idea why the Mexican government would just allow one cartel to just rule the drug market. Um, try to think about just like, okay, so what does the maximum Mexican government actually want? Probably wants less violence, less people to die, um, less dangerous drugs maybe. Um, um, yeah, et cetera. And so now you can know like, okay, maybe like having one cartel monopolize a drug market will help reduce cartel violence. Um, and so always understand what the, I call it the metrics. I know other people have different words for it, but what are the impacts that people are trying to go for in this motion? Um, and it could look like reducing violence, reducing sexism, or solving this real world problem, or it could look like fulfilling an actor specific interest if it is an actor focused motion. Um, yeah, so that's how you know that you're on clash in a debate. Next slide. Yep, Lucy's turn. Okay, cool. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll just take over over this. So, um, yeah, so after you have these initial qualifications done, so after you know broadly the, what the wording of the motion means and what it is very broadly about, the second thing you want to do is to 
like briefly discuss the upsides case. But this might sound a bit intuitive because people are like, if it's my prep time, but my case, like why should I talk about the other side? And very often you see debaters just immediately jumping into their arguments, especially if they like know what the motion is about. So like they really want to generate as much as possible. But I think what is strategically much more useful is to spend the first part of the prep actually talking about the other side. So why should you do this? I think broadly three reasons that I just outlined here. So the first one is it just allows to make your case more robust and less vulnerable to obvious attacks. So what happens if you just go immediately into your case? Very often you miss the obvious rebuttals. So what happens then is that your PM gives a speech, LO gives a very obvious rebuttal, and then you spend in DPM three minutes having to rebuild the entire case once again. Now, if you already at the start of your prep consider there is this very obvious response, you can make the initial argument more robust. So already it's preempted in the PM and all has to do much more work to actually land the rebuttal. So that's the first reason. The second reason is you do not spend time on analyzing claims that no one will contest. So very often what happens is, for example, in motions like um, this household heavily subsidized female only tech companies is that even like really good teams on golf um, give really good analysis about why it's really helpful to have women in like positions of power and women as CEOs. Now, the problem with that is that while that analysis might be brilliant very few op teams are going to stand up and are going to be like, no, we actually really don't want women on top positions. That would be a bad idea. What is more likely that op is going to say is things like there are X, Y, Z reasons why these companies are not going to be successful and it's actually going to hurt women instead of putting them into top positions and making them like influential. So if you know that this is going to be the line of attack, you can prioritize spending time analyzing things like why these companies are going to be successful. So your impacts actually land because once you get to those impacts, no one is going to contest them. They're going to contest whether you are getting there. So the prioritization of the things that are going to win or lose you the debate are determined by you knowing where exactly and to like to what parts of your case the attacks are going to come to. The third reason is that it allows you to anticipate closing or backload. So like in many cases, you are going to be in a position, like I think OG is a clear example, where you will just hear very few actually direct responses. So if you are OG, you will just hear one speech, you will just hear LO, um, you won't hear anyone else. So if the only thing that you can, you will, uh, can I get it back please? Um, if the only thing that you can respond to is the LO speech, there might be a bunch of other responses and a bunch of other really strong cases that your case is not um, is 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 uh, not responsive to just yet, and CEO can just really easily rebut you with something very obvious. So if you consider all potential op cases, you can kind of um, defend yourself from a strong CEO, even though you won't be able to engage with them directly. So even if, if LO is really weak, um, you will still be able to have the case responsive to other op speakers that might be stronger. So those are the reasons why you should do it. I really recommend it. Do it at the start. Don't do it at the end. If at the end you're going to be like, oh, like now what, what can they say to this? And you realize your whole case is kind of irrelevant. Um, that's a bad idea. So do it at the start. So how to go about it? Um, the first thing is outline the strongest and the obvious op claims. So I think Jacqueline already said this. Don't spend like 10 minutes constructing op case for them. Don't go into like biggest details. Don't think like, what well, is this like really niche response they could give? Just think about the strongest, obvious, smart claims they could reasonably give. Now, after you do that, think of what are your claims, how are you going to be dealing with that, and identify where exactly are going to be those contentions, where are those spots where the debate can be won or lost by one side. So there are a couple of examples, which I think are actually kind of exhaustive, so it covers a lot of debates. Um, in many debates, it's a combination of a bunch of them, um, but I think this is this should be quite exhaustive, um, how, how these contentions can look like. So for example, um, say both government and oppositions are, opposition are likely to agree on how the motion placed in two different contexts. So for example, no one is gonna contest that this is going to be a very positive motion in say the developed world. And none of the sites is gonna contest that this is going to be quite bad and negative in the developing world. So the contention then is, 
a sort of framing about which of those contexts is this motion more likely to be enacted or where the scale of these impacts would be bigger or more important. So does it matter more that it's going to be bad in the develop, developing world or would it matter more that it's going to be positive in the developed world? So that's where the contention is going to be. Everything else is basically agreed upon. Um, second possibility, um, say both government and opposition agree on what impact is desirable. Um, this is the case in like most say feminism or minority related motions. So that the, 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 the impact is like we want to help, help women or help minorities. It's like hardly ever anyone would try to contest that that's a good thing. But then they disagree on whether the mechanism of that motion is effective or it's harmful. So again, the contention there is the, the rigorous mechanistic analysis. So it's, is this mechanism good and effective or is it bad and detrimental? But no one actually contests the impact. So you're, you want to prioritize the mechanistic analysis rather than describing the goodness of the impact, because of will just say we agree. Um, the third is when government and opposition actually disagree on which impact is more desirable. So each of them arrive to different impacts, probably agree that each of them derive to different impacts. The question is just which one they think is good and which one is bad. So for example, in many social movement debates, you have one side saying the motion is going to lead to big mass mobilized movement of allies. And the other side is going to say, oh, it's our side is going to lead to more like small but really committed movement. So those are two very different impacts. Uh, the contention then is weighing of which one of them is better, which one of them is more important. Um, so again, those are different types. And if you identify correctly where the contention is going to be, you can spend a lot of time doing specifically winning on that contention that en ends up winning your debate and you deprioritize the things that are not contentious. Um, okay, uh, just the, uh, the question, because I think this might be relevant. Um, if we know based on com uh, com experience that CO was the strongest team and we were OG, should we spend more time on the diagonal or just prep normally? Um, so I don't think that, you, so you're probably not going to be prepping like, what am I going to say to CO? What am I going to say to all, right? You're going to be asking what's the op going to say. It doesn't matter if all says it or CO says it. Um, you're just going to think of the strongest op cases and you're going to be responding or like you're going to be building your case to respond to the strongest possible op case. It doesn't really matter if CO or all gives it. Um, so yeah, uh, I think it, the difference probably comes whether you think it's CO or CG. So maybe if I'm having a stronger CG and I know the op bench is kind of weaker, I might be spending more time like really, really dumping. But I think like in general, like if you know, if it's between CO and O, then it doesn't matter which op brings it. You just prep against the best possible, strongest possible op. Cool, I uh, hope that makes sense. Uh, yeah, can I have the next slide? Okay, um, so basically what we want to do right now is uh, we want to illustrate how approximately that prep can look like uh, via kind of going with you through an actual motion and illustrating uh, what exactly we will be doing, what would the thought process be. So I hope that was um, clear about identifying the contentions, then obviously you would go and like analyze exactly the contentions. That's what we're going to do as an example within the exercise. So um, the motion we want to send to the exercise around is the motion. Um, oh, can I open the chat somewhere? Yes. Um, the, this house believes it is in the interest of dominant organized religion for their leaders to declare more progressive interpretations of traditional dogma. So e.g. on dietary and pilgrimage requirements or the acceptability of contraception or same sex relationships. Um, so I hope that motion is somewhat clear. Cool. Um, so I just want to go through the basically the entire prep and how that prep would look like. I'm going to be asking some questions like uh, later Jacqueline will also be asking some questions. Please try to answer just by like unmuting yourself. Oh, uh, yeah, it would be great if we didn't have to talk to like empty Zoom because that would be awkward for everyone. Um, so in terms of the initial clarifications, um, so as we said, you're going to be asking yourself, you're going to look at the motion and kind of consider different questions about it. So first, I'm going to look and I'm going to ask myself, is there anything in particular to considering regarding the motion type? I look, I see it says it's in the interest of dominant organized religions. I know that I'm going to be talking about whether it's good or bad for the 
organized religion. So probably any like arguments about this would be good or bad for like the world in general uh, are probably not particularly relevant. Second, I'm going to ask, is there anything in particular to consider about the wording of this motion? So I think the main thing to, to think about it here is, for example, what can I expect to be meant by more progressive interpretations of traditional dogma? So do we mean like a big shift? Do we mean like very small? Is it going to be gradual? Um, is there some way we can like think about how to analyze which one it's going to be. So I'm going to like question what, like come, give some examples so both me and my partner kind of understand. So like my partner doesn't think that it's going to be about legalization of gay adoption whilst I'm going to be thinking it's about like vaguely stating that like gay people might not be sinners. Um, so I kind of clarified that with my partner. Um, and then I'm going to ask why was this motion set? So what problem is the motion trying to address? or what are the broad interests of the actor? Um, so yeah, I'm gonna test if this actually works. Uh, anyone has an idea when you look at this motion, um, what could potentially be the problem that this motion is trying to address, both if you just see a problem or if you can think of what, for example, dominant organized religions might be caring about very broadly. Maybe for like modern day, um followers of religion who are unsure about like modern problems and what that religion would have like suggested especially if they believe so firmly in their advice mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay so yeah so like modern like your religions following uh yeah and and james is saying in the chat in terms of decline of religion so that's broadly the similar things so i think both of you are correct right so probably what the motion is trying to be about and what both sides are going to be trying to address is the decline of religion um on what side we kind of get more following more influence etc um so this is obvious but it's very useful to like state this with your partner so you say yeah obviously this is going to be about um declining religion where we get more followers um yeah cool uh can i hit the next slide Right, okay. Um, so this is a big ball of text, uh, but I'm going to try to um, work through it. So um, through this, I'm going to kind of illustrate the thought process that would go in both considering the golf case and then kind of coming up with the broad lines, say, if I'm in opening opposition. So like, I'm going to be doing this from perspective if, if I'm all. Um, so the first thing I would do is I have this motion and I'm going to think, okay, what is golf going to say? So we already correctly identified that this is going to be probably something about the decline of religion or where we get more followers. So the idea I'm going to have is, look, Goff is probably going to say something like, A, they're going to frame that the societal values are becoming more and more progressive. So they say that the problem that currently exists is that many people are alienated by conservative religions, which is why the dec decline is happening as we correctly identified. The second thing they can do is they say by becoming more progressive, you are able to attract more young people or prevent young people who say grew up in religious household from leaving, um, say in favor of uh, secular, uh, secularism. Is that how we pronounce it probably? Yeah. And thirdly, then they can say that larger following is desirable for religions and give some reasons as to why. So like if you look at the, uh, broadly at the, 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 the structure, the first bit is the kind of framing um, characterization. The second is the main mechanism they have. The third would be like impacting. So once I have this and I know that this is going to be the outline of golf case, I'm going to ask, okay, so what am I going to say that's going to um, specifically, um, that, is, uh, that, that, that can um, actually interact with that? How can we beat it? So the first thing I can ask regarding the framing is I'm going to ask, is this actually true? Is this the correct characterization? So probably in the West, I can't really claim that societal values are not becoming more progressive. That's probably going to be not really contestable. But I can ask, is this true everywhere? And that's where I can have a case, right? I can say, look, in the majority of the world, you still have quite conservative values. And in that context, you would probably not attract many new followers. Instead, you would probably alienate more of, more of existing ones. So given that, again, this is the example that I gave before. So both of us agree that this might be 
perhaps positive in the West, I can contest that later, but say we agree it's positive in the West, but negative in the developing world. The contention is, does it matter to organize religion how the, what the outcome is in the West, or does it matter more what the outcome is in the developing world? So that's the first contention. And then we're gonna walk through it later. Um, the second, I can engage with that mechanism. So I can say, even if we're talking about the context of the West, is it, we, I can say it's actually unlikely that even if religion becomes more progressive, it can anyway provide more value for young people, which is why they are likely to leave anyway. This is not going to change much. So this is not like flipping or destroying the argument, not that. It's just mitigating it, but it can be very, very clever and clear mitigation, which makes that case like very, very marginal. So again, to win on that mitigation, I, the, the contention is which of these scenarios is more likely? Are young people going to come to religion if it becomes more progressive? Or are they not going to be, are, are the minds are not going to be changed? So that can be about questions about what values actually, like what's, what's the value of religion that it can provide, like what are the psychological mechanisms young people have? So the second contention. The third thing is my own kind of constructive harm. So I can say there are many reasons as to why more devout followers, if this shift happened, are likely to be alienated of that, from that religion. So for example, because the dietary and pilgrimage requirements and like observing those things that like gave them a sense of community that they really care about and now it's lost, or because those sacrifices were something that they personally really valued and now they are being told that they actually didn't matter. Um, so for all those reasons, they are likely to become less devout and they are likely to be alienated. Uh, which is uh, detrimental for religions. You don't want to lose your devout following. So the contention here with the impacting of government is that assuming that both teams prove their impact, so GOF does get more young people, but I lose more devout followers, which one of these impacts is more important? So is it more desirable to have large following of young people or would it be more desirable to have maybe smaller uh, but full of the um, the, the devout people that would be more, more committed. So then I'm going to be weighing off these impacts. So that's the third contention. Cool. Does this make sense? Uh, anyone, if anyone has any question or anyone wants to clarify anything, just tell me. I know that this is like a lot of material and it's my thought process. So like if anyone doesn't get it, like it's completely fine. I'm happy to clarify. Cool. Then it was either really clear or really unclear. Um, cool. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through the contentions, uh, hopefully together, um, if you continue being active like you were. Um, and Jacqueline's going to take over and um, we figure out how exactly you can go and analyze those contentions. Next slide. Hi everyone. Uh, so first is the contention of framing and characterization. So again, this is what we went through. Uh, we kind of briefly touched upon before, uh, which is that you know the religion is supposedly everywhere in the world, um, and so there are two kind of broad contexts in which you can frame this motion into. So there's you know the Western developed world um, in which you know like society is looking much more progressive, and you know religion is in decline, and then there's a developing world context. Um, so the proposition might say like in the Western context, you know, like because society is becoming far more um, progressive, we need to attract more people to religions, especially young people. Um, and then in opposition, they say like, look, um, these progressive values that this motion asks you to espouse, maybe they conform with secular progressive values in the West. But maybe, like most likely, a lot of these progressive values will seem quite radical in lots of places in a developing world that right now are more politically conservative and are more socially conservative. Um, so actually what you're gonna be doing when you say like things like, ah, it's very okay to, for example, be LGBT, or you say things like, ah, you no longer really have to follow all these strict dietary guidelines, um, even if you live in a country which is, for example, like a theocracy, um, what you could could end up doing is that you push a load of people away from this religion um, in the developing world. So if you are in proposition, what would you say in order to try to prove to the judge that the Western context is more important? Um, so let's start with that first. Anyone have any ideas?
Okay, so just like, so broadly, I, the ideas that I have is just that, for example, like a lot of Western followers, maybe you can say like, it's more important to get Western followers um, in the Western world, because that's may, maybe like Western followers have a lot more capital to devote in the first place. So maybe a lot of Western followers give large sums that keep your church upright. Um, Yusuf says like a lot of religions often get a lot of income from charitable donations from Western followers. Yep, exactly, right. Um, so for example, the West has a lot of money that they could give you that keeps your organization alive. And you need to tell me then why money is more important for, than, for example, getting a huge followership. Um, and then you can, what more can you say? You know, like I think similarly to economic capital, they, the West tends to have a lot of political and cultural capital as well. So they, for example, tend to also dictate what norms should be, like should be um, in the developing world. So for example, loads of multinational, like multinational like charities, development organizations attempt to push things like human rights and progressive values onto the developing world. It's very likely that in the long term, a lot of these developing world countries are also rapidly progressive, right? like becoming more progressive as well um, because of things like rapid globalization and globalization in context where the west determines what universal cultural values are so for example when it's mostly western media it's mostly western political culture that loads of people consume and they think is important probably this means that the developing world will rapidly become more like the West in the future. So maybe you can outweigh it that by saying like, look in the short term, the developing world may be um, slightly more conservative now, but what we see, especially in lots of metropolitan areas in the emer in in emerging markets like Indonesia, they're becoming more and more indistinguishable than for example, New York, right? Um, and George says, it's more difficult to push followers away with changes in interpretation than it is to gain followers. So yeah, you can say that. You can say like after you've committed your entire life uh, in your entire like culture and country is based on following a specific religion and it's the only thing you've known, probably a change in interpretation won't push you away um, because that's the only life that you have ever known. Um, and then you can say just probably because of this, we have nothing to lose uh, when you're trying to gain these important Western followers. Yeah, really good. I think that I really like that. Now let's do the other side, which is like, probably I think that it's slightly more intuitive. So why do we care more about the developing world? If we were in opposition and trying to prove that the developing world outweighs or is more important as a context in the West. You can unmute yourself as well, yeah. Like a lot of developing world countries aren't like, like Western countries in which we have like a separation of like religion and state. Like a lot of um, countries have religious law as their law, as opposed to um, like just a general mm -hmm. law. So it would be like, to so to look at law as religion in those countries would be how you'd have to look at it in a lot of places yeah so you can say just like in a lot of places for example some places in the middle east have a lot of religious scripture built into their laws and so to for example completely contradict laws would be an incredible offense so just like the degree of the offense is probably much deeper so progressive values maybe you can say like if you're in opposition like maybe saying that you know being gay is okay that would maybe mildly appeal to a young person um who's going on buzzfeed but it would greatly offend uh, someone whose laws contradict that right um and so you could say that like the degree the intensity of 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 the appeal versus the offense is completely asymmetric so that's one side um then they can say like yeah, religion is a key source of charity in the developing world. So you can just say like, yeah, like maybe you can say like, you know, religion has a duty towards helping people in the developing world, pu pushing people away and having people go out of the, the grip of, of religion means they no longer get that really valuable charity. Um, you can say, what else? Uh, you can say Western states instructions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think we already covered what Vicky said. Um, more people really, yep and so you can say like uh probably you want max number of people so i think this is what i was trying to get out of the developing world just like really simply you don't have to go like galaxy brain on this kind of way just say like look developing world bigger than the west um the west is the us and maybe like some parts of europe right um 
the developing world is everything besides that. Um, uh, so because of that, there are more people who live in the developing world or what we constitute as the developing world than the developed world. So the degree of which you're going to like push people away, the, the scales of people you're going to push away, is going to be much greater than whatever minute following you might get in the West. Because of this, you're going to be losing en masse huge amounts of followers. Um, so yeah, you can talk about why that's really harmful as well. Um, so you can do things like scale way ups. Um, you could argue if you're making a claim that followers are more about in the developed world, a development. Yeah, you can also yeah you can also just say like uh like really like people who have been more devoted to you they deserve to have more of their religious beliefs respected. So what I want to hit upon with what Joe and Tom has said. Um, so Tom says like religion is a key source of charity in the developing world, um, and then Joe has said. Um, the people who follow religion in the developing world tend to be more devout and therefore deserve to have their religious beliefs more respected and more reflected in what dog the interpretation of dogma is. Um, and so be careful when you say stuff like this, because if we could go on the previous slide, Tom. Tom, yeah. So note. The motion says this house believes it is in the interest of dominant organized religions. So try to be really careful. So if you're going to tell me, oops, I got groceries coming. Okay, so if you're going to tell me that like, oh, people deserve to have their religious beliefs espoused or reflected in religious dogma or like ch religious charity helps followers, you need to tell me why this is in the interest of dominant organized religions. So dominant organized religions are not equivalent to their followers. Um, you got to tell me why it is in the interest of the church or the interest in like the, the people who lead the Muslim community to actually do this, not just the, like that's generally good for religious people. Um, cool. Um, so I have to pop off slightly. Um, Lucy's going to be taking over. All right. See you guys soon. Uh, cool. Yeah. Can I just, uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to one, I think this was enough of a, um, oh, uh, so not in the interest of followers, but of the, of the organization. Yeah. So we we'll specify them given that the motion says in the, in the interest of specifically the organized religions, it usually means but specifically organizations, very often it's that. So you can explain why like followers matters as, matter as well in for those organizations, but it's specifically should be the leaders and the organization. So I think that was probably enough in terms of the two different way ups. I will just once again, uh, walk through the strategic purpose of this. Um, just to make clear, like if we win this contention on either side, why did it matter? So the strategic purpose of this is that if you manage to prove that the developing world matters more, even if Gough would achieve all their impacts about getting young people in the West, etc., etc., they will lose to you unless, uh, well, let me just accept, the, yeah, and they still lose the debate unless they then go and engage with you in the developing world context as well. Like once you prove it's more important, nothing that they say is going to matter and they will have to beat you in developing world. Otherwise they're gone. Cool. Uh, can I have the next slide? Okay. Um, so then we have the second contention. So the second contention was in terms of the analysis. So on Gough's side, you want to say that young people would be attracted to religion if it became more progressive and they would be likely to join or less likely to leave. Or on op, you want to say young people would not be interested in religion anyway, and that trend would just stay that way, so they would leave in either side. So the question we are asking is which of these scenarios is more likely? So um, let's start with um, why would young people be interested in religion had it become more progressive? So think about what values or what things can religion offer to young people um, that it doesn't when it's super conservative and it would if it became more progressive. Um, yeah, feel free to unmute or type. Maybe people who feel like their religion is like counteract, like contradicting their cultural values or um, like, for example, LGBT, that's not a choice. So if they feel like their religion isn't accepting of them as who they are, they might be more likely to leave. Mm -hmm. And if it, they are being accepting of that, then they feel like they can actually stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think that is. I think that is uh, a good one. Uh, that what Ricardo says in the in the chat. Yeah, because it's another community 
uh, that they would be able to relate to it. This is especially important for young people. So I think this is also really smart. So you can say young people are just interested in having some communities and it's really helpful to have something where you can relate to. Now it becomes more progressive, so it's more aligned with your values. So you don't feel the conflict between like, for example, supporting your LGBT friends and being religious. This is something that is a community that is accessible and that you can get the benefit of, of um, having somewhere to feel uh, related to. Yeah. Um, is there anything else about like religions, religions can offer besides just being a community that you can relate to? Or be belong to? Maybe also that they feel like they have guidance with their life right now, as opposed to advice that belongs to a context like thousands of years ago, which they feel doesn't really apply to them now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so yeah, so in terms of guidance and what you saw this saying in the chat, sort of greater purpose or meaning, I think those are all very smart. So what you want to say in on Gov then is that firstly, what was said at the start, now, right now you have the conflict between um, supporting your progressive friends or holding to progressive values of the society versus religion. Now when that conflict disappears, religion is still very valuable for you because of the greater purpose and the meaning or because of the fact that it provides you community, which is why um, young people would be happy to join it because it does still give them a lot of meaning. Cool. Um, so if we are on the opposite side and we want to claim that that would not happen and on either side young people will be just leaving religions, um, how would you do that? So how would you rebut the previous claim? That young people wouldn't be so quick to suddenly accept the change without wanting to know more about why this has suddenly become a thing, why people have been hammering down on these issues for so long and they're suddenly changing their minds and they might not be willing to suddenly believe that um, all of a sudden these people have been accepting when they haven't been in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's one option. Um, any other? I think when people start uh, response to this uh, movement by the organized religion, when a counter uh, movement starts, they'll have more research, like thousands of years of proof they are wrong. So it will uh, it will further um, cause problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think that's I think that's also true. I think it maybe uh, relates more to the next question about how it affects like the more devout people. But I think, for example, a way to mitigate what Goff says is just saying things like, like, look, the reason why religion is something that is uh, desirable, why people go for it, is a specific like unique. I would say competitive advantage if you want to say it in economic terms. But things like. Um, Oh yeah, before I go, uh, a change in an overall religion traditional views may not actually translate to followers view, e.g. parents might still hold um, traditional views. Yeah, so that is, that is, that is also definitely true. Um, so it doesn't suddenly become acceptable, uh, like, ex like acceptable for young people and desirable for young people to join uh, just because the leaders say something if the, if, if parents are still like promoting the same, so religion still appears conservative to young people regardless. Um, I think that's also good. Uh, or you can say things on the other way, um, that um, religion has the competitive advantage of, for example, things like having the common observations of the specific like rituals or, or observing the dietary requirements, or observing specific festivals um, that are really important for people in the sense of community and that is lost if you do not have these things anymore. So like even young people, there's no reason why young people will be attracted to religion if like the competitive advantage or the reason that makes religion unique with like those traditional things is suddenly disappearing because then religion basically becomes secular and there's no reason why a young person would like want to be religious if they can just be secular at the point where it becomes basically the same thing. So that's a way where you can, it doesn't destroy the Gov argument, but it mitigates how much, how impactful it is and how many people are actually going to be joining as a result of it. Um, yeah, so the strategic purpose of this just to, um, yeah, uh, would you be able to argue where the progressive claims do not entirely address? Um, yeah, so also it depends how Goff mechanizes it, right? So for example, if Goff tries to go really soft and they say something like, oh, we're going to be like, 
slightly changing the shift like we're gonna say oh like like gay people are not sinners but we obviously not gonna do like really big shifts you can exploit it and you can be like yeah in that case that impacts are also not gonna happen uh because um uh, like young people probably want significantly more and then at the point where you address if, we, if you address all those things and you actually made a massive shift and religion basically becomes the same as the secular ideology in which case again it has no like actual temptation for anyone to join. Yeah, um, so just to uh, reiterate the strategic purpose of what we've just done uh, before I give it back to Jacqueline. Um, so if you mitigate that claim of about young people, you can win much more decisively because you will be comparing a very marginal benefit on Gov's side. So just a few people are going to join versus a substantial harm on ours once we explain why you're going to be losing a lot of the devoted followers. Cool. Um, yeah, uh, Jacqueline, you can take the next slide. Great. I'm back. I'm back from putting away my groceries. All right. Uh, so the last contention um, that Lucy mentioned um, in the breakdown of arguments is this way up argument. So one side says, ah, more people, are, young people are going to join. And then um, the other side says, ah, but devoted followers are going to be more alienated by these progressive interpretations. And they're either going to be less committed or they're just going to be leaving. Um, and so assuming that the scale is symmetric on both sides, so an equal amount of young people join as, uh, as the number of you know, devout followers are going to be more alienated, um, how do you exactly weigh up which of these impacts um, the judge should value more? So any ideas about you know, why young people are more val valuable a following to have in the first place, if you're arguing inside government? Is this arguing assumed based on the fact that devoted follow followers will definitely leave a wee like is that oh, an yeah. assumption? Yeah. So this is like the even that? if. So yeah. So this is the even if. So when you're in government and you're saying like here are a couple of responses to what opposition have said, and you know, it's just like, okay, even if like they prove that loads of devout people are going to go. Let, let's say like the same number of devout people are going to go as the young people we're going to get on our side that's still preferable. You can just say like, oh, we still prefer that. Um, and so why would you still prefer, prefer that? So you, you can say, so Ricardo says, because it's a strategic play in the long run because old people die. This is a very legitimate response, which is to say like, look, um, probably young people are more important because old people are eventually gonna die. And then you'll have zero followers because you didn't play in the long term. Um, so that's a very valid way up. And it's often quite used actually quite frequently um, when you're, like weighing off young people versus old people. Um, religions often believe that they have to actively save lives by converting non-believers. Um, so you can say, yeah, so you can maybe say like, we want to save maximum number of souls. Um, and so you try to convert as many non-believers as possible. You can say that you have to define what the group offers. Young people could revive a fallen movement. Um, devout followers may have a deeper understanding of a religion. So you can say like, okay, yeah. So I think try to be a little bit more specific here. Um, so building on what Joe has said in the chat, he said that young people could revive a fallen movement, but devout followers will have a deeper understanding of the religion. Um, so young people, what does it mean when they revive a fallen movement? Does it mean that they make it hip, modern, modern interpretations, for example, like, you know, they make it, they're going to build it in all that pop culture, they're going to make memes about it. Um, you can say like, this is really strategic in the long run, if we're going to have a sustainable retention um, and recruitment of new people in the following. Um, and then if you're in opposition, you can say just like, uh, up the more devout people have, I guess, a more authentic interpretation of their religion. They'll be more devout in how they follow that religion, how much time they commit to it, for example. Um, and looking, Eleanor, if young people become followers, it's more likely that they pass it on to the next generation and the religion will continue in the future. Yep. Um, so I think this builds on that last idea, right? So if young, more young people join, they will be more likely to pass it on to their children. Um, but you have to be very careful here. So if the older generation, you know, if they were religious um, and they attempted to pass it on to their kids, but the framing says the kids aren't into it anymore because they're all woke and they're too progressive, you have to then justify in the future when the children of the children are going to be even more progressive, why would intergenerational, intergenerational passing of religion necessarily work? So try to be a little bit more careful. Um, young people are being religious increases the church's prominence in society as they become older. Yeah, you can say that, uh, you know, these young people are eventually going to age and they're going to become, you know, new community leaders, new political leaders, and this is really important if you want to maintain relevance in the modern era. You can say historically trying to fight progressivism has always 
historically backfired because progressives have more reach. This sounds like a bit of an assertion. Um, so try to justify why progressivism always wins, especially if I can point to a counterfactual, which is like, obviously, right now, we're regressing back into the Stone Ages where we don't respect science uh, and we don't respect decency in politics. So obviously, progressivism doesn't always win. Um, and so um, to summarize some of the really good points that we had, old people die. Yeah, young people tend to be able to have more modern interpretations and can make it more lastingly relevant for future generations by building it into culture, um, building it into modern media, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, cool. And I think another one that people hasn't, haven't really mentioned is bit that maybe like young people, um, like especially like if they're part of mainstream society rather than devout committed followers who maybe operate on the fringes of society maybe they're more politically important to loads of politicians so if loads of politicians see that a bunch of new york young people are now super religious this could really make a difference to how relevant you are in for example mainstream politics um and so this could mean like you know mainstream political parties now back you because they see that the voters are becoming more religious and want to pander to that religious sentiment um cool and so what if you're in opposition now? I'd rather, like you'd rather have more devout, committed followers, like the people um, who live in really tight-knit religious communities. You want to keep them on board. Any ideas so far? Yeah, so you can say just like, so um, Ricardo says like, as soon as you try to reinvest in young people, you're going to have to do this over and over and over again, as values become more and more progressive. So you seem to always, always be changing a traditional dogma in order to maintain that influence of young people as generations change. So you can say like, this is not a very sustainable solution if you constantly have to do it. Rather, you would rather have one consistent dogma that people like, like note that committed followers don't don't necessarily mean old followers. They just mean, you know, committed religious followers. So it could just mean that you want to have one traditional, one consistent dogma that maybe transcends generational, like pro generational gaps um, that, you know, people from all generations, as long as they lived within a religious household or religious community will be able to buy into. Maybe that's a more sustainable strategy. Um, they're more likely to donate. Yeah, very true. So for example, the very devout, the intensity of that devotion is probably going to be asymmetric on both sides. So if you're recruiting new blood, new young people, unlikely going to be as intense about this new religion that they found to go to church every Sunday to devote, to donate large sums of their income to the church. So you can say like, look, devout followers um, who believe and really care about religion, they're the ones who are going to be willing to give us money, willing to devote their time to us, um, to campaign for our interests in politics, etc. So we'd much rather back them. Um, committed, yep, yeah, so Ricardo says the same thing. Um, yeah, and so Yusuf also says the same thing. So like the, the more committed followers are willing to give you that time, political capital, and money um, that you need to sustain your religion. Um, so yeah, so I think the opposition way up was really good. Yeah, and you can say, yeah, and Omar says like equally, you can say like young people don't really have lots of ability to influence politicians of politics and people maybe don't vote as much. They're not as engaged in politics. What we'd rather have is like really committed political pressure groups. For example, like if you live in the Bible Belt and you have loads of religious communities who are super devout, willing to write to them, like local representative, show up to like local caucuses to speak speak on religious behalf, religion's behalf, like you'd much rather have that than kind of a lukewarm young people who aren't super engaged in, in politics or religion. Yeah, control of the Karens, yeah. Yeah, it's like obligation, yeah, you have more of an obligation to current followers. Um, yeah, so like, again, like, I don't, like, it may not be so strategic to try to introduce like the idea of obligations into this debate even though you can do stuff like that in like, this house believes that it is in the interest of an active focus debate um obligations tend to be really hard to prove um when one side just says like look we prove that we get more followers or we prove that we get the more important followers obligate like stuff like you have more of an obligation to your current followers than new ones it's kind of hard to weigh up um approve why it matters more than, you know, getting more politically impactful young people or something like that. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, I think that's the end of the workshop. I think this, I think people were really good at doing the way up actually. Cool. And 
final part is just to be flexible. So what we went through is just one motion. And as you can see, there was loads to impact there and there's loads, um, there was loads to preempt and there's loads to discuss. Um, but every motion will not be like the motion that we just did. Each motion will require different amounts of work put into different parts of prep. So we try to do a motion which covers all three, like different parts of analysis, different parts of framing, different parts of impact. But each motion will you know, concentrate on one of these three more than the other two. Um, so try to be flexible in trying to understand what emotion requires more. Secondly, also note that you don't always go through prep time with the same person. So lots of different partnerships have different dynamics and you need to be very flexible to that. Um, so loads of successful partnerships try to have the yin and yang. So one person maybe dom like not dominates, but like maybe leads discussion a little bit more and the other person asks like leading questions. So maybe one person is saying like, oh, I think these are the three main clashes. And I think this is what our arguments are going to be. Um, the other person would just be like, yeah, but you need to prove why this is true. You need to prove to me why this impact may matters more. So they kind of ask complementing questions to make that analysis even more robust. Um, and some, you know, some, some the debate partnerships are 50-50 completely down the middle. Um, and so you need to be very aware of how that dynamic works and how to make it work between you two. So try to be flexible, um, try to complement each other rather than butt heads. Yeah, and finally, check and question each other. So this is kind of what I talked about before. Um, a lot of times you just need a sanity check in lots of these prep times because 15 minutes in, things are really intense. You want to generate arguments as fast as possible. It's really good to have one person, preferably both people, remembering that you need to ask really specific questions and be really critical of your case. So it sounds really terrible to have, but it's good to have a devil's advocate in the room while you're discussing your case. Um, to ask things like, like, for example, if one person is saying, here is our argument, this is the framing, this is the analysis, and this is the impact. One person to just be like, yeah, but why is this framing important? Why is this, why is it the developing world just important? Um, or they could just be like, yeah, but I don't get why young people would want to draw in your religion just because you're more progressive or just like in the impact. I don't know why young people even matter in the first place. So like maybe probably said a little bit less annoyingly than that or gratingly, but to ask those questions to make you robust. Um, so always have that sanity check and check and question each other all the time. Um, so don't fall into that same trap where you just think that something is obvious and you just buy a lot of assumptions that are just going to be taken down in the debate right after. Great. Um, so I think that's the last slide. Uh, I think we're going to start doing spars now.